Hello and welcome to another day of living with spina bifida. Today I am going to talk to you about Chiari malformation, also known as Arnold Chiari malformation. Now I know by looking at the title of this video, you're going to want to pronounce it Chiari, but trust me, it's Chiari malformation. What is Chiari malformation? You are probably asking me now. Chiari malformation includes a complex group of disorders characterized by herniation of the cerebellum through the large opening of the base of the skull into the spinal canal. The herniated tissue blocks the circulation of cerebral spinal fluid in the brain and can lead to the formation of a cavity within the spinal cord. So to explain it a little bit easier, we have too much brain for our skull to handle. There are three main types of Chiari malformation. Chiari malformation type 1 involves the extension of the cerebular tonsils, the lower part of the cerebellum, into the foramen magnum without involving the brainstem. Normally only the spinal cord passes through this opening. Type 1, which may not cause symptoms, is the most common form of Chiari malformation and is usually first noticed in childhood or into adulthood, often by accident during an examination for another condition. Type 1 of Chiari malformation is the only type that can be acquired. Patients who experience patients who exhibit extreme joint hypermobility and connective tissue weakness as a result of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or Marfan syndrome are susceptible to instabilities of the cranial cervical junction thus they are at risk for acquiring Chiari malformation. Type 2 also called classic Chiari malformation involves the extension of both cerebellar and brainstem tissue into also the cerebellar vermis may be only partially complete or absent. Type 2 is usually accompanied by myelomeningocele spina bifida, which again is the form of spina bifida I have and the form of Chiari malformation that I have. So more often than not, people with spina bifida, especially if they have myelomeningocele and hydrocephalus, they will most often have Chiari malformation as well. Type 3 is the most serious type of Chiari malformation. The cerebellum and brainstem protrude or herniate through the foramen magnum and into the spinal cord. Part of the brain's fourth ventricle, a cavity that connects with the upper part of the brain and circulates cerebral spinal fluid, may also protrude through the hole and into the spinal cord. In rare instances, the herniated cerebral tissue can enter an occipital encephalocele. The covering of the brain or spinal cord can also protrude through an abnormal opening in the back of the skull. Type 3 causes severe neurological defects. Type Four involves an incomplete or underdeveloped cerebellum, a condition known as cerebellar hypoplasia. In this rare form of Chiari malformation, the cerebellar tonsils are located in a normal position, but parts of the cerebellum are missing, and portions of the skull or spinal cord may be visible. Chiari malformation has several different causes. It can be caused by structural defects in the brain and spinal cord that occur during fetal development, whether caused by genetic genetic mutations or lack of vitamins or proper nutrients in the maternal diet. This is called primary or congenital Chiari malformation. It can also be caused later in life if the spinal fluid is drained excessively from the lumbar or thoriatic areas of the spine, either due to injury, exposure to harmful substances, or infection. This is called acquired or secondary Chiari malformation. Primary is much more common than secondary Chiari malformation. Individuals who have Chiari malformation often have these related conditions. Hydrocephalus, like I said, I have, and most commonly people with spina bifida do have. Though it can occur with any form of Chiari malformation, it is most commonly associated with type 2. Spina bifida. Naturally, you may have guessed, 
I do have spina bifida. And individuals with type 2 Chiari malformation usually have myelomeningocell type spina bifida. Chiringomyelia or hydromyelia are cerebral spinal fluid filled cysts that are found on the spinal cord. Another cord occurs when the spinal cord attaches itself to the bony spine. This progressive disorder causes abnormal stretching of the spinal cord and can result in permanent damage to the muscles and nerves in the lower body and legs. Children who have myelomeningocele spina bifida have a greater risk of developing tethered cord later in life. Chiari malformations may also be associated with certain hereditary syndromes that affect neurological and skeletal abnormalities. Other disorders that affect bone formation and growth, fusion of segments of the bones in the neck, and extra folds in the brain. The most common signs and or symptoms of Chiari malformation are as following, but not limited to headaches. Headaches like you have never experienced before. They're not normal headaches. They're not migraine headaches. They're Chiari malformation headaches. And more often than not, there's not really much that can help a Chiari headache. And they are most often aggravated by Valsalva maneuvers, such as yawning, laughing, coughing, crying, sneezing, or straining of any sort, bending over or standing up suddenly. So that is the number one big sign of Chiari is the headaches. Tinnitus, or ringing in the ears. Learmite's sign an electrical sensation that runs down the back of the spine and down into your legs. Vertigo or dizziness, nausea, nystagmus or irregular eye movement. Most often the eyes will start going downwards without really even meaning to. Facial pain, muscle weakness, any muscles, it's not picky. Impaired gag reflex, difficulty swallowing, restless leg syndrome, sleep apnea, sleep disorders, impaired coordination. Severe cases may develop all the symptoms of vulvar palsy, impairment of function of the cranial nerves, paralysis due to pressure at the cervical medullary junction may progress in a so-called clockwise fashion, affecting the right arm, then the right leg, and then the left leg, and then finally the left arm, or it may go the other way around. Papillal edema due to increased intracranial pressure, popillary dilation, rapid heartbeat, chest pains, breathing issues, fainting, extreme thirst, and chronic fatigue. The blockage of cerebral spinal fluid flow may also cause a syrinx to form, eventually leading to syringulomelia, central cord systems such as hand weakness, disassociated sensory loss, and in severe cases, paralysis may occur. In the past, it was estimated that the condition occurs in every one in 1,000 births. However, the use of increased diagnostic images shows that Chiari malformation may be much more common. Many people with Chiari malformation show no signs or symptoms, and their malformations are only discovered when they are being treated for another disorder. The doctor will perform a physical exam and check the person's memory, cognition, balance, touch, reflexes, sensation, and motor skills. The physician may also order an x-ray, a CT scan, or an MRI to properly diagnose having Chiari malformation. Some Chiari malformations are asymptomatic and do not interfere with a person's activities or daily life. In other cases, medications may ease certain symptoms such as pain. Surgery is the only treatment available to correct functional disturbances or halt the progression of damage to the central nervous system. Most individuals who receive surgery see a reduction in their symptoms and or prolonged periods of relative stability. More than one surgery may be needed to treat the condition. Posterior fossa decompression surgery is performed on adults with Chiari malformation to create more space for the cerebellum and to reduce pressure on the spinal column. Surgery involves making an incision at the back of the head and removing a small portion of the bottom of the skull. 
and sometimes even part of the spinal column itself to correct the irregular bony structure. A related procedure called spinal laminectomy involves the surgical removal of part of the arched bony roof of the spinal canal to increase the size of the spinal canal and relieve pressure on the spinal cord and nerve roots. Now for me, I am just recently learning more and more about Chiari malformation. I just very recently found out that I even had it in the first place. And then I found out that I am born with it. But the doctors never actually sat down and talked to me about it. They never told me I had it. It's just in my records and I just happened to fall upon it because I was looking through them for another reason. And it seems like doctors either don't know that much about it so they don't want to talk to you about it or as long as you're not showing any symptoms or having problems from the Chiari malformation they just leave it alone and they don't really want to worry about it until it's basically too late and you're going down this horrible path of terrible health. Basically you get to find out the hard way that you have this really awful thing going on inside of your head. So it turns out that's what has been going on with me for the past several years. That's why my health has been going down the tube very, very fast as of recent. It was a very drastic change at first. It started off when I moved from Illinois to Minnesota with strange heart palpitations and really strong heartbeats and also breathing issues. What I have learned to be called air hungry. It constantly feels like I'm not getting a proper breath. Like there's constantly something sitting right here. So I went through, so I went through multiple tests to find out basically that there's nothing wrong with me. My heart is fine, my lungs are fine in all areas. All the tests came back nothing wrong. So I dealt with those two issues for three or four years and as of I'd say less than a year ago, we'll say six months, I have had all these really neat added issues. Started off with severe fatigue. I could sleep for 16 hours and it still wouldn't be enough. I'm just never getting enough sleep no matter what I do. I go to bed proper time as suggested by experts. Go to bed early, wake up late, take naps, doesn't matter. I'm always exhausted. So I have extreme fatigue and now I have almost constant vertigo, always nauseous, always dizzy, and eating definitely makes the nausea worse, but I gotta eat, so sometimes I just gotta power right through that. Sometimes yawning is about the only way I can get a proper breath in these days. Anyways, I'm not sure yet if it is related or not, but I have I have an appointment next month to see what is going on with my nasal passageways because again, like my chest feeling like there's constantly something here, it feels like there is constantly something pinching my nose. So I can't even get a full breath properly in through my nose. Wallowing is getting more and more difficult. Sometimes I can't even swallow my pills in the morning and they're not even that big of pills. So sometimes I choke on my food, I choke on air, I choke on nothing. Just my airways are not proper these days. Pain, pain, pain all day long. The headaches. They were not lying about those headaches. When you get a Chiari headache, 
you've got a Chiari headache and it's not going away until it decides it wants to. For me, it's always right here and it constantly feels like I've got something stabbing into my brain. Like an ice pick stuck in my head. And it just won't come out. So most of the time I just have to power through those because I do have a life so I have to live my life with these issues. My newfound pain is mid back pain. I've never really experienced back pain in the middle of my back but it is a very sharp pain. I don't have those electrical pains quite yet but maybe that is the start of electrical pains. I do have restless leg syndrome. That's a new thing. I had it when I was pregnant. And then when I had the babies, it went away. But the last month or so, it's come back. And I also have pretty severe, almost constant elbow pain that may be related to tethered cord. And I have some appointments in May again to maybe get that checked out. So I'm not sure if that is related or not. And lately, I, I talked earlier about the getting headaches and from basically coughing, sneezing, putting any sort of pressure on your head. But for me, when I sneeze, it feels like my whole being has been shot out of me. I have no life left in me and I'm just weak and almost useless. I can hardly move just from sneezing. And that's really fun. I actually had to crawl up the stairs to bed the other night because I couldn't use my lower extremities. So <laughs> that might be all of my ailments as of right now. I might be forgetting some that don't happen quite as often, but as you might know, as you probably could guess, it makes things a little extra difficult to get life done. But I'm doing my very best. And if you know me in my personal life, if you're on my Facebook, you might have noticed I am not holding back these days when I'm having a really rough time because I don't believe in the complaining too much idea. If you're having a bad time, let people know because there's going to be someone out there who can relate to you. And I'm not necessarily doing it for pity or I don't really need the feedback. I just want people to know what's going on in this new experience that I am having in my life. And I just want people to see that even though I am struggling minute by minute, I'm still doing my best to be a normal functioning person the best that I can. And that's all anyone really can do is if you have issues, let someone know. Maybe they can help you in one way or another if it's just to listen and not judge you and tell you to stop complaining. Or it's just good to get things out of you and into the world no matter how you decide to do it. But don't forget you are not alone and if you need a someone I will be the someone to support you in any issues that you are having.